All right, um, the time is exactly 10 o'clock on my devices, so I believe that it is the right time for us to begin with our program. As you all are aware, we only have one hour for this session, so time will really be of essence in our one hour slot here this morning. I am Dr. Nozipo Gumbi and I, I will be the program facilitator for today's session. Just a few housekeeping rules before we start with our program. I wish for all of us, if you are not on the podium or on the floor asking a question, please keep your, your mics and your cameras on mute so that we do not disturb those who are on um, and sharing their presentations. When time, when we have a bit of time at the end, we will take a few questions in terms of you raising your hands and we answer your questions, but feel free throughout the course of this one hour to put your questions, comments in the chat box, and we will be responding to those as we go along with the program. So don't wait until the end. If you have a burning question, uh, drop it in the chat box and we will be responding to it. So without any much further waste of time, I will hand over through a video, of course, to our Executive Dean of College, Professor Peggy Mamba, who is going to give you a an official welcome to UNISA's College of Science, Engineering and Technology, which is abbreviated CSET. You would see throughout the course of the program and in your studies, you'll come across this CSET throughout. So that's what's basically it. So we allow our executive dean to welcome, to give an official welcome that we take you through the facilities that we have in our laboratories before I hand over to our speakers for this morning. Thank you. Welcome you to our college. Welcome to UNESA. You have made the right decision to join us and be part of a group of students of pursuing knowledge in science and engineering. As a first year student joining our institution, you may be wondering what lies ahead for you. We believe there's still a future in this country for people to be involved in the exploits of science and technology and engineering for the betterment of this country and for its future. You are coming to a college whose engineering qualifications are accredited by the Engineering Council of South Africa. You are coming to a college which enjoys international recognition for its research of expertise and high caliber academics who are there to impart you with knowledge and who will make you become one of the greatest students of UNESCO and you'll be proud that you are coming part of, of this esteemed university. You may not know that UNISA has been celebrating 150 years of existence and many of the universities that are in this country have been born out of UNISA. And we have produced even the state's president, like President Nelson Mandela and President Ramaphosa. And we are proud to say that UNISA is the University of the World. Having come to the College of Science, Engineering and Technology, we are coming to a college which boasts a high level of state of the art infrastructure where you'll be introduced to equipment and instruments that are of a par with others that you can find elsewhere in the world, be it in the US, Europe, and in China. We endeavor to give you the best education which will make you proud to call yourself a unison. In the college, 
which was the school of computing. So it's like information technology, and it's like computer science, and it's like information systems, and the Academy for Contemporary and Future Technology. In the college field, in the School of Science, this was the Department of Chemistry, Department of Mathematics, Department of Physics, and the Department of Statistics. And it's also called the School of Engineering, where it's like mining engineering, it's like electrical engineering, and it's like industrial engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and chemical engineering. And beyond that, we are proud of our institutes who are doing high-level research, such as the Institute of Nanotechnology and Water Sustainability, and the Institute of Catalysis and Energy Solutions. We are nearly serious to study in all of the four programs in science and engineering in our community and elsewhere. So having joined the College of Science, Engineering, and Technology, you'll be part and parcel of a family where you interact even using technology, where you'll be taught from a distance science and engineering and you have, have the opportunity to come to our campus and be able to play with the equipment that we have and do practicals that are relevant. And you are allowed as well to be innovative. Your ideas are never taken for granted. Who knows, maybe you'll be the next Einstein coming out of this university. With those few words, I would like to welcome you to the College of Science, Engineering, and Technology. We are always open to assist our students. We have administrative staffs and academics and chairs of departments and directors of schools who are there to respond to your needs. And I'm glad you are part and parcel of us and we want to help you to realize your future career aspirations. Thank you very much and all the best and we wish you well. Apologies for the minor disruptions there as we try to get the video back up.
<clears throat> Colleagues, can I get an indication? I'm seeing a lot of comments saying that there is no sound. There was no sound. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. OK, so if you don't mind, because it's quite a short video, I'll try that again and make sure that this time around we do share the sound. Um, OK, include sound. The College of Science, Engineering and Technology. Are we hearing any sound before I proceed? Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Technology, CSET at UNISA is a world-class teaching institution working with the community to bring innovative technological development to the people of Africa. CSET is positioned to provide problem-solving resources to our infrastructure poor country. UNISA's state-of-the-art science campus allows students and researchers the luxury of working in an environment that enables them to flourish. CSET has the best tools for the job. Visiting and associate professors from some of the world's most innovative universities work with CSET staff and students to grow their capacity. Knowledge sharing with the world's best is part of what we do. CSET focuses on improving the lives of the people of Africa through the use of innovative technology. We teach our students to be hands-on, problem-solving citizens of the world. CSET has three schools, the School of Science, the School of Engineering, and the School of Computing. Our academic staff have an enviable reputation for publishing and presentation. Undergraduate studies commence at the beginning of the semester while postgraduates can apply to study year-round. With UNISA's open distance e-learning model, students study remotely and then come together to do practical work at the campus in Johannesburg. Upcoming virtual and remote labs will allow innovative ways for UNISA to make science, engineering, and computing education accessible. All of CSET's qualifications are locally and internationally accredited. Students can study computer sciences, mathematics, engineering, and even astronomy. STEM learning is the way forward for our country. CSET students come from all backgrounds and then apply and share the knowledge they learn in their own communities. Science, engineering, and technology is for everyone, and we're making that possible at UNISA. Africa has the world's youngest population. With over 30,000 students enrolled, CSET is going to be a big part of a bright African future. Join us to make that a part of your future. Right. <clears throat> Apologies for the technical glitches. Um, I wish to relay our apologies for the minor technical glitches there, colleagues. We would be moving swiftly right along with our program. For the ones that uh, could not hear properly the volume and everything else, I will share the clips on the chat box so that you can watch these videos as well as the welcome message at the luxury of your own time. Apologies once more. Without any much further waste of time, let me invite Miss Leticia Bernade to take us through the practicals in the School of Science as well as how things operate in that space. Miss Bernade Leticia, it's over to you at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gumpy. I appreciate it. Uh, could you just give me an OK once you can hear me clearly and you can see my screen? Yes, I can hear you and I can see your screen. Please proceed. Perfect. Thank you. 
Thank you so much into presentation mode. OK, so first of all, thank you so much for everyone for joining us today and very welcome to CSET. Today I'm going to be talking about specifically the practicals you guys have been registering for. And it's going to maybe be your first time that you're going to have a practical. So let's discuss that. And specifically, this will be focusing on physics and chemistry. Some of this will apply to engineering and even in engineering students, you guys will see there's some chemistry and physics in your modules. But right after me, there'll be a big discussion about engineering uh, specifically. So let's start off. First of all, everything I'm going to say will be included in your tutorial letter 101 for your specific module. You can find that by going to your official study material and in that section you'll find tutorial letter 101 and everything that I'm going to say is in there. So uh, let me just get rid of that. Okay, so what does a practical module look like and how does it differ from a theory module? So we have, oh, there we go, Throughout the year, you're going to be doing various activities, uh, maybe assignments and things, and that will be called your year mark. And then at the end of the year, for most theory modules, you're going to have something called uh, exam mark. But so for, for, for your year mark, these are th going to be things you're going to be doing at home. Well, as for, let me just get a laser pen. Uh, so you're going to be doing things at home, but for your exam mark, Generally, for your theory, it'll be exam, but for practicals, you'll be either doing a practical or some kind of a portfolio, and this means lab work. So in all of those videos, you've seen people doing some things, and some of those are first years, and you're going to be experiencing all of that yourself. So let's say, for example, an important thing to, to, to cover in your year, you'll be having maybe assessment one, two, and three, just as an example. And the important thing with a practical module is that you need to pass these assessments. And some of these assessments must be passed in order to give you access to the practicals. So for you to be able to come to the practicals, make sure that you go and look at your specific module and make sure that you meet those criteria in order to come to the practical. When you come to the practical, what is that going to look like? Well, there's usually some kind of a prep work, we call those pre-labs. So maybe you'll have to uh, do a flow diagram or something to make sure that the experiment that you're about to do, that you've, you've sort of read through it, you understand what you're about to do in the lab. There might be things like a RAB report. So while you're in the lab, you're, you're collecting data, you're analyzing very interesting things, and then you write up a report about it, or you fill in a report, again, depending on the module that you're going to do. Some lecturers love a good pop quiz, so do be prepared for those, but most lecturers at the end of the practical rather have a practical exam. So we see if everything that you've learned in the lab, you actually have, you've learned it, you've got it, you've got it under, uh, underhand, you pass that practical exam, and that wraps up your entire exam practical portfolio mark for a practical module. Talking about labs, you, you could see in all of those videos, people are wearing specific gear, and we call those PPE. And for specifically for a lab, you're going to need a lab coat. So you can buy one of these in various places online. You can hunt around a little bit, get them nice and cheap. But generally a lab coat, or some, sometimes I call them dust coats. Um, engineering has specific dust coats as well. Those are interchangeable for us, as long as you come with one of them. That is one of the things that you must have to enter a lab. Another thing is goggles. You don't want strange chemicals or machinery or something to fly at your eyes. So we generally wear goggles to protect our eyes. So these are the two things that are musts for you to be able to work in a lab and work in a lab safely. Other thing is gloves. If you guys need gloves, we'll be providing those for you. So don't panic too much about gloves. But if you have a latex allergy or something like that, you just make sure to bring a few of your own gloves. But you will know that or you won't know that. So don't panic about that. There will be gloves in, a, in the labs for you guys. Other than that, uh, dress code. Uh, for, from a dress code perspective, we have to do certain things, just like a lab coat, and one of those things is closed shoes. So making sure that you have nice closed shoes, just in case something's falling on your foot or in case something is happening, making sure that you have uh, nice shoes on to protect your, your feet is a better idea than just randomly coming in with flip-flops or something. Hair tied up, we don't mind how your hair looks. It can be in any style you want to, to have it, but please just have it tied up. The reason for that is if you're working with some machinery or something like that and your hair is loose, you bend over and it goes flying into the machinery or you drop it into a nice beaker of acid or something like that. So just make sure it's out of your face and tied up just so that you don't get into any accidents. And lastly, long pants or long skirts is always advisable in a lab because these are things that just make sure, again, something running down your lab coat, it drips on your pants instead of on your opened legs. 
Again, all of what I'm saying right now is in Tutorial Little 101, so don't panic too much about it, but these are basics about keeping safe while you're in a lab. So what else might you need to know about a lab? Well, first of all, what to bring. Every single module will have a little tick list for you for things to bring. On that tick list will be something like a lab coat and the goggles and things like that. So check on your module. We send many of these. They'll be on the module. You'll put email to you. You'll get invitation letters about it. These things will be told to you as you sort of move along through the module. Choosing a slot. Most modules, because there's so many of you guys and we have lab capacity that we have to fill up, they will usually be one slot or another slot or maybe even more than that. So for example, for first year chemistry, we are looking at about four or five slots this year. So you get to pick the slot that works best for your situation. So maybe you want to come earlier or come later. One of the slots will suit your circumstances better. You pick that slot, you commit to that slot and you come through and do your practical in that slot. Okay, where are the practicals? You've seen many pictures in the videos so far. They're found here in Joburg at the Science Campus. It's called the Eureka Building. It's a very pretty building. And talking about that, this is one of the chemistry labs. You did see some of the, uh, the, the slots. I do see there's lots of questions coming in. I promise I will get to those. Um, as Prof um, Becky, Becky said, absolutely world-class laboratories. I've been to many labs in South Africa. I've been to many labs overseas. These are absolutely stunning labs you're not going to want for anything. We have generator capacity and what that means is during load shedding you will not lose access to your free Wi-Fi but more importantly you'll also be able to complete your practicals. So nothing to worry about in that kind of instance. You're going to become, you're going to come through and we're going to absolutely look after you. Physics, you can see the labs look extremely different and right in the middle here there's some of the equipment they use. So half of these lab experiences is to try and get you to learn how these things work, how do they, how do they apply to various situations. Okay, this is a group of students that I was trying to get to take a very pretty picture, but they were having none of it. And eventually I did get them to sort of calm down and take a very official picture. Hopefully I can get some of you to be in the picture. They all agreed to be in the picture for our advertising. But my point with showing you this picture is 100% that I know studying online, studying distance can sometimes be a little bit lonely. So these events are usually students love coming. They love meeting other students. We have staff in the department that are still friends with the, the first year that they came to their first year prac with like a million years ago and they're still friends and it's, it's a really good experience. So I know it's a bit panic inducing. There's a lot to arrange and maybe come through and obviously you're going to be doing a lot of learning, but there's also an element of fun. Most of the questions that I do get, there's three big ones and just for a matter of time, I'm just going to go through these three. So why are the practicals not online? As Prof Mamba said, governing bodies, SACWA requirements and extremely high standards is how we run our practicals. This means that once you get your degree, you can go to any university in the world and you will be recognized for the skills that we have taught you and what you have learned. So we, we don't want to cut that off. We want your, your degrees to be worth a lot and for you to go wherever you want to, doing whatever you feel you want to do with your life. So that's why we, we keep the standards in a specific way. When are the practicals? Each module will obviously have its own practical dates. Please check on your module sites. We are tentatively waiting just a little bit for the election dates to be announced. So some of us are waiting because it could be anywhere from, from May into August, which is our prime practical periods. Okay, and lastly, why are there not potentially practicals near me? Because we want you to come to these world-class labs. And also, if you were to do a lab, a lab somewhere else, then maybe you might not pass because we don't have all the support systems that we have here for you. But do check with your, your lecturers in your tutorial letters. There might be some options for you, but most of the time, all the students love to come. So don't worry about it. Make some plans. I know most of you, like I said, absolutely love it. So th those are some of the general questions that I do tend to get. Uh, but if you have anything else, please do pop it in the chat and I'll be happy to answer for you. Thank you so much, though. I'm going to add and over back to you, Dr. Gumby. Thank you very much, Miss uh, Letitia. That was a very insightful presentation. And indeed, we cannot overemphasize enough the level of or the world-class facilities that are available at our College of Science, Engineering and Technology. You don't want to not be a part of this experience. So thank you very much for that. 
um, colleagues, I will again emphasize that we keep putting those questions in the chat box and colleagues who are with me in the organizing committee, please let's try to respond to those questions as we move along with our program. I'll now like to invite Professor Ndo, who's going to take us through the School of Engineering Matters, how things work under the school and everything else that we need to know. Thank you very much and it's over to you, Prof Ndo. Um, we can see your slides. Yes, they are on presentation mode. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Tango Gombi and morning um, students and colleagues. Yeah, my name is Ndibondo. Um, I'm from the School of Engineering. I will be going through um, some of the activities that we do. As the previous speaker said, that most of the thing you will find it on the tutorial letter. So same as the engineering, you will find most of the stuff on the tutorial letter. So I just want to tell you about um, student in Daba. Uh, we have student in Daba um, every year. It depends on the de on the department. Other department do it twice, others three times a year. So this student in Daba is more about understanding your challenges, your concern, your queries, so that you can resolve uh, the problem that you have before you 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 engage on the um, uh, on your studies because we don't want you to get lost because once you get lost many students tend to deregister the qualification so please attend our student in Daba once you get uh, this invitation from your department please attend is important because that's where you you can ask question uh, that you don't understand don't assume things um, uh, please attend and ask questions um, we have something called graduate attribute this was introduced by EXA EXA is our mother body that uh, control or regulate uh, our qualification. So this graduate attribute is more about um, assessing outcomes uh, in your um, module. There are modules that will have graduate attribute. Not all modules have graduate attribute, but those modules that have graduate attribute, please take care of graduate attribute because if you don't um, achieve graduate attribute, you will fail the module. Graduate attributes they are there to to test the competence of the student, and this was um, um, done through. Oh, sorry, sorry. I think I've just come out. I don't know what I've done. Uh, can you still see my uh, my screen? Uh, I think I've lost something. Yes, yes, okay. we can see it. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, this was um, this graduate attribute. This was um, uh, done through. Uh, signatory countries um, of the SIGNI Accord. It means international country, they form um, a committee, then they call themselves SIGNI Accord, whereby they, they recognize each other um, qualification. So it, it can go to Australia, New Zealand, uh, America, your qualification from South Africa will be recognized. So you don't have to do uh, the test whether to check whether you are a good engineer. Once you receive the qualification here in South Africa, you can go anywhere uh, where these countries have agreed and form a um, uh, statutory. So our qualifications are recognized um, by this uh, Sydney Accord. And again, in South Africa, is uh, EXA is taking care of that um, um, qualification. So graduate, graduate attribute is very important. So you must uh, make sure that when you are lecturer, uh, explain to you to say this module have a graduate attribute. Pay attention because if you don't do those graduate at, um, graduate attribute, you may fail the module because you may pass that assignment. But there's a certain portion on that assignment that it require you to do graduate attribute. Um, for example, graduate attribute. Um, let, let's say you are doing a module whereby they say there's a graduate attribute. I think it's number eight. Um, because there are 12 graduate attributes for, um, for diploma and 11 for advanced diploma and 11 again for the BH Tech Honors. So if your lecture say this, this project have graduate attribute, pay attention because like uh, graduate number eight, we say teamwork. So if your lecture say this assignment is for the team and we are not um, contributing in that team and other students confirm that you are not part of the team, you'll get zero on the graduate attribute, meaning you won't pass the module because you did not um, do what was required on the graduate attribute. When they say this module have a presentation and you don't come and present, 
you will fail because um, graduate attribute goes together with the presentation in some of the modules. So uh, uh, as I'm saying, not all the modules have graduate attribute. In most cases, you'll find the graduate attribute in the um, um, research module, wheel module, project and design module. That's where you'll find graduate attribute. Yes, other modules have. Uh, have. And the most places where you find this graduate attribute is when they do assignment, lab, test, project, but especially on the project, because that's where we have agreed as a school that we put more graduate attribute on the uh, project design wheel module and research modules. Who oversees um, uh, this um, graduate uh, attribute is our ex, as I say, our extra is our mother body that represents um, statutory Sydney Accord in South Africa. Okay, graduate attribute, as I say, there are um, uh, 11 graduate attributes, but on the, um, I'm sorry, there are 12 on the uh, on the diploma module, but there are 11 on the advanced and 11 again on the PH Tech Honors. So if your module, let's say it, it have graduate attribute uh, number eight, as I was saying, so it will say individual test and multiple multidisciplinary working, meaning we are going to work as a team. They want to see your involvement on that particular um, project. If you did not play any uh, role, then you will be given a zero and you will fail the module. So again, uh, in another um, a module, maybe they will test graduate attribute number three, which is design, um, design aspect. So you're going to find the module for design and the lecture will ask you to design something. If you don't design and follow the design criteria and specification, then you will fail because they will be testing you on that design regarding the graduate attribute. So pay uh, more attention on the graduate attribute. Mr. Mohale will present um, regarding graduate attribute impl implementation, how we how we implement this graduate attribute at uh, UNISA. So here, another aspect that I wanted to share with you is a student award. Believe me, if you work hard, we will recognize you and we'll give you awards that go with some, um, some monetary value of, of, of money. It depends on the level of the qualification. So study hard, you'll be recognized, it's important. Uh, because this is done uh, through the department. Other departments do differently, but yes, we do recognize students that are doing well. Work integrated learning, we call it WILL. So, um, you know, as an engineer, you must do WILL. It's a compulsory module. It carries 60 credit. It's a big, big module. So WILL meaning that we are going to do a, um, experimental. It's either you, you find a company that you'll be working so that you can apply your theory into practical. So there will be some form of a guide that you need to complete once you do uh, work integrated learning. Uh, there will be um, well, uh, I mean, will co coordinator from the department that will visit you and see what type of work you are doing. Is it an engineering work? If not, then they will advise the supervisor to give you work that is engineering work because we don't want you to fill uh, forms that are, are not necessary because you are not applying engineering scheme. So time to time, your will coordinator will visit you and see what type of work you're doing and then advise if you are not doing the right one. So for those students who, who are not able to get um, work integrated learning outside UNISA, uh, or maybe from the companies, because we prefer you to go outside and find opportunity job where we can apply uh, will integrated learning. But if we are if we are unable to get opportunity outside, uh, UNISA have um, uh, have uh, come up with a way to assist students those who are not getting job outside. So we have in-house training um, uh, that is funded by Mercita Fund. Uh, we give students stipend, it's not a salary because it's not that much, it's just uh, for you to get uh, transport money and all those things. So you can see the team here is students that we're doing well um, in, our, uh, in our labs. So um, 
this um, grant cover industrial engineering student, electrical engineering student, um, mechanical engineering student, and then chemical engineering students, they got their own grant, mining and the civil, uh, they don't have a grant as we speak, but they are looking for it. But if we are one of the department, mechanical, industrial, and uh, electrical engineering, you can get um, a, a stipend from us and the chemical engineering, they got their own stipend. So uh, you, you can see the type of work or project that students do. Uh, they've designed um, and fabricate um, uh, badger. You can see the badger. We have went to the competition. Uh, I think the last competition that uh, we went, we we come number one and second, where we were competing with the likes of University of Pretoria. So we beat them, meaning that our student can apply engineering theory into practical. So they've designed this and then uh, uh, fabricate until to the end. Um, and then other project that you can see on the side there is a wheelchair. Uh, we have designed and fabricate wheelchair that uh, we have donated uh, to the needy. So you can see that our student is, is not only project uh, just to do and then maybe we destroy. We can do project that uh, we can donate with. So yeah, this is some form of the project that we normally do um, inside the lab. So you can see that our students are doing something good. And then other project, uh, we, we do solar. So we have the student themselves, because we, we give this to students. They must come up with their own ideas, own innovation. So they design this, uh, fabricate, manufacture, all these things, uh, solar car. So they have done the solar car, uh, I think last year, which um, went to the competition and they drive this car from uh, Houting up to Cape Town. Of course, other places they get stuck and then they tow the car, they fix the car. The students themselves, because they're the one who have done the car, they were fixing the car, they know the problem and all those things. So our students are very competent, to be honest. They compete with others. The car drive from, as I say, from Houting to Cape Town. So you can see that they've done something uh, good and wonder. Other project you can see uh, is a big wheelchair there, uh, but the solar one that is uh, powered by solar. So these are the ideas for students. Yeah, you can see even the design is a little bit big, but we encourage the student to come up with the ideas whereby we can change them there. But all, all in all, this is a student project. Uh, they come with this project and then uh, we allow them to do all. We buy uh, the material for you. Uh, if you want to be part of the team, we buy the material so that uh, we can you can enjoy um, to be an engineer. Um, when it comes to practical, uh, it's not different from what the previous speaker have said. Um, normally, you will receive uh, announcement um, on your emails to say the dates are available. So you can go and uh, select the slot where when you want to come uh, to the campus. All the practical are done at Florida campus. So you must drive, whether you're in Cape Town, you must arrange, you must come to the Florida campus. So what they normally do on the day of the practical, uh, they will they give you, sorry, they'll give you equipment where you will um, work on, you get the data. From there, you take the data that you have collected from different um, equipment. It, de it depends which machine are you going to work on on the particular day. Uh, you collect the data and you go and prepare the report at home. Uh, and then you you submit on the my model. So that's how we we do our practical. Of course, other lecturers maybe may like you to do uh, some home-based practical, but there are not many. Maybe they say go and do the practical on the refrigerator or something like that on the home refrigerator. But mostly 99% uh, of our practicals uh, at Florida campus. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Professor. No, they're taking us through the School of Engineering offerings, um, assuring us or um, emphasizing the point of not assuming things, but if ever you have questions, please do ask. And also the aspect of graduates attributes, that's quite important uh, for 
one to take into account. Now, moving swiftly right along, but of course, please keep putting your questions in the chat box. We will be answering them. I will be inviting now uh, Mr. or Dr. Z Ali, who's going to take us through the assessments, uh, particularly the iris invigilation uh, tool that is used for assessments and exams. Um, it's over to you, Dr. Ali. Uh, thank you, Ganwe. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> uh, I hope I'm audible enough. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, uh, we okay. can hear you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, the I, the invigilations is uh, is uh, part of the 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 examination uh, rules and regulation, and of course, as part of the institution, every student that is registered and writing exams, uh, specifically in CSET. Uh, in, of course, in some of other colleges as well, uh, the students, you, you do have uh, uh, something called uh, invigilations. And one of those is, uh, is, we call it iris invigilation, we use mostly in CSET. So the, uh, as a student, you, 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 you will be required to, to, to install iris. So what is iris first is, uh, is like an, an invigilation uh, remote intelligence system that uh, help the students to write from from home and what it does is uh, it record the videos and audios and your screen uh, and everything that you are you are doing on your laptop or on your desktop now uh, the idea is it help us also at the same time to reduce on the academic uh, dishonesty and we hope that uh, we give more trust to our students the, the, for you especially the upcoming one uh, at least we we'll give you more trust so that you can you can also align with us. Uh, and and in addition, it can also help us to 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 locate exactly uh, which distances uh, each student is writing from from each other. In a sense that there is a GPS location on on that it can help to see if the students are trying to cheat or writing in close to, uh, close proximity areas, uh, so that we want to avoid such things. Uh, and then what, what do you need for IRAS? So basically you just need to have a, an, an internet so you can have a, a, an internet connection, a good one. Uh, and then you need a, a laptop. So and of course, maybe I need to say that IRAS does not work on cell phone or tablet for now. So please, you need a laptop or a desktop uh, machine so that you can you can install IRAS on. Uh, and you, you need to have also your, your laptop and desktop should be uh, should be should, should, I mean your microphone and your webcam should be should be working. Uh, a laptop without a webcam it doesn't help. And in addition, you also have to have a specification on the on the RAM of the laptop. So and and also it should be as a 64, so that at least uh, Iris can run uh, properly. If you don't have if you don't meet those one, you can still run Iris, but you might lead into troubles when when loading uploading your your recordings, so that it, it might crash or somehow. Unless sometimes if your internet is good, you can still get away with it. Uh, so, uh, additionally, so I need to bring to your attention that uh, uh, for 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 IRIS to work, and not only not only about the the previous requirement, but also about the the type of laptop. So the the new laptop usually have some fi uh, some different requirement, and also if you get a laptop from from friends. If that laptop is from work, uh, if it's from his work, it's it not gonna work. It's not gonna work. Iris won't be running uh, smoothly, and the reason being that those laptops from work usually have some some settings that might block the the pop up or might block the camera or the the the, the microphone. And you don't put glasses, uh, even if you have issues, you have to first uh, bring it to the disability uh, section. You don't put headset or you have glasses and all those when you are writing the exams. So those are things that you please avoid if you can. To install uh, IRIS, you need sorry, to have... Doc, yes, Dr. Ali, we, we are yes. no longer seeing your screen. If you can please oh, okay, reshare me... again. Yes. Okay. Uh, go back. Let me reshare my entire screen, then I'll look at uh, the file. Okay. Yes. Uh, I was here talking about the 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 mi microphone and the and the webcam. Uh, now, 
now the problem is from my end now my screen is not moving um, okay all right so i said you need uh, you need to have google chrome or microsoft edge installed on your on your laptop so that at least you can be able to 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 install iris and add the the extension into your your laptop so that you can be able to use it so <laughs> for those who are using uh, macbook and linux laptops so you you get uh, likely you'll, you'll only have google chrome uh, and of course the new laptop also have microsoft edge uh, however, the old one do not have uh, MSH installed, so you, you might have some few issues. But everyone with the with the Windows laptop, you won't have any issue with that. Uh, as for the extension, you have many options. You can directly download it uh, just on Google Chrome or on Microsoft Edge. Directly download it. You can also go to the to the to the to the Chrome Store and also add it from there. You just type Iris, and you should be able to 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 see it this way. Once you click on it, it gives you the option to say Add to Chrome. Or if this was Microsoft Edge, then it gives you the option to say uh, get. And then once you click get, you add it. And after adding the extension, Iris uh, plugin should be uh, should be installed on your on your laptop. That's uh, it's a uh, easy straight uh, forward. Now for you to write the examinations, the exam section will circulate uh, uh, a specific link where you where you actually write your exam from. Uh, uh, and some others in different depending on the assessment or in the college where you are some people write on model some write on exam site and for the exam site please do not worry it will be shared with you and even for the IRS close to the examination the exam site will the exam section will share with you the the possible links for for instruction and there is also IRS website on the exam site where you can also follow the instruction and actually also get all the links and or, or know also all the installation and so on, so, so that should not be an issue. One other things we struggle with, with the most is uh, when when you log into it doesn't matter on my Unisa on on the exam site. Uh, you should you should be able to to follow some instructions. So there will be a small pop up. So if you are using a private laptop uh, or, or I mean if you are using a, a work laptop, this option won't be available. So basically, you will have to allow the microphone and you will have to also allow the camera before Iris can run correctly. So please uh, also, you, you, these are part of the instruction. You can also tick some of the agreement. Once you have Iris, the moment you, you click on the exam site, it should pop up a screen of this form to tell you that uh, click on the user agreement, then click on, uh, on continue. Something is straightforward. So these two double pop ups. Uh, and then from there, you should be able just to follow the the the, the the same screen on this screen once you do the first one you get a tick it means that your mic your webcam is fine then you click on the next one and the next one and the next one until the last one which is the most important the last two where it says share screen and begin assessment we have so many issues on those and i'm going to go directly so entering your student number your name that should be all easy and then the part of ca capturing your id you need to show your id to the camera uh, holding it with your left hand, capture with the right, or vice versa. It doesn't work. Then, once you click on the share screen, you will see the the one in grey here says share screen. You will get this small pop up giving you instruction of what to do next. So you literally just click on OK. Once you click on OK, it will give you this small blue where it says share screen. So you have to click on it. If you don't click on it, you will wait there. So most students that they just send us this screen should say my screen is not being shared yet. So you have to first click on that green share screen. After you click on it, you will see this small pop up. It says Iris wants to share the content of your screen. You again have to click, click on it because you will see your picture very small here. Once you click on it, then the share button will be active. If you don't click on this small screen, this share button won't be active. So these are one some of those technical issues, but because you're going to have so many trainings on this and you'll see also so many videos, so you will be able to, to, to pass this. It's, it's very easy, in fact. After that, you'll just click on Start Assessment and then you begin your assessment. It doesn't matter if it's an MCQ or if it's a file upload. If it's a file upload, then the, the iris will automatically go down or you can literally minimize it from the top right corner. Uh, here, this one is a Linux, so you can minimize it from the top left corner. So for those using uh, Linux or, or Windows and so on, others will see it on this right hand side. So it's still going to be. And after writing the exam, uh, you're going to literally click on finish recording or stop sharing so after you finish you can just click finish recording then it will load 
your your recordings, then you can literally RS will go after that. Sometime once you finish the exam, it will automatically go if your internet is good. It will automatically disappear. It will upload within a few seconds and then it goes away by itself. And and then you can literally. So if you are you are writing the file upload, you can just at the bottom here you scroll down. You will see the iris icon uh, here saying iris is sharing your screen and the other one is saying stop sharing as one say hide you don't touch those you leave this small uh, window here as it is you don't touch it and and then you just scroll down you click on this on the screen and you scroll down once you scroll down you should be able to submit your file there and then that's it so apart from that we had issues with the upload because students who are uh, having uh, internet issues usually their 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 recordings or their video recording takes longer to upload for that you have to be patient you wait for it sometime for two three four five minutes then it gets uploaded and and you should be uh, go ahead now sometime for those who do not meet uh, their laptops or their machine do not meet the minimum requirement you will see a warning message like this when you see a warning message don't don't be scared just read it it say warning do you want to continue uh slide to the right to unlock so which means uh, the iris uh, the warning message unlock the iris uh, the iris uh, upload the video upload or the or the audio upload or the pictures upload so what you need to do is you literally this blue icon you literally move it to the right hand side until the end once you move it to the right hand and sit the end, then the, the yes will be active. You click on the yes. You see at the moment it only say no. If you click on the no, some of the recording won't work. So we'll only get few uploaded, those who upload it on time. So you can literally move this to the right hand side, drag it. Once you drag it, the, the, the yes will be, you will, will be like this active. Then you can click on the yes and you can carry on with your work. So I think that's all. And this is the last part of the screen that you should always see. Uh, once you see this screen, it shows that your upload is in progress. You have to wait for it until you see that upload has been, uh, your recording have been uploaded successfully or your, your upload is uh, is complete, then, then you, should be, you should be done after that. Now, in terms of issues, you usually uh, have issues in MCQ or other even in the normally. So if IRS doesn't, doesn't, doesn't close after you finish writing the exam, you can perhaps literally close it from the top right corner, as of from this side or from this end, you will see a, a red X here uh, on that, as on the top right corner or on the, on the top left corner. Then you can click on it, you close it. And if you have other issues, then you can always, uh, there will be a call center where you can contact and, and also the lecturer should be the, the most ideal person. So normally, once you are writing here, I showed you the, the file upload part. This is where you, if you are writing file upload. However, if you are writing MCQ, once your iris is populated, the MCQ, the, the iris should enter the, the password for you automatically. And once the password entered automatically, you're supposed to click on begin assessment and then or you supposed to click on start assessment then you click on start quiz and you go you go so you don't need to click on the password to, to delete it if you remove it then you won't be able to go however uh, if iris is running correctly so you don't have to, to request for the password if you see this uh, here insert password you don't have to click on it at the moment so uh, you can minimize it. If your password is not populated automatically, then you can you can try to clear the catch and we'll also populate. I will also share those with you. Uh, I think when the, the time is right. All right. Thank you so much. And I, I hope because I anticipate that I can tell you it's good, good luck for your examination. So I'm not sure how many months from now, but yeah, I, I was just wishing you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali, for the presentation on IRIS, an invigilation tool that certainly all of our students are going to be exposed to when it comes to their assessments as well as their exams. Um, I will now move on and invite Mr. Silo Mohale to take us through the assessments process in general at CSET. <coughs> Mr. Mohale, we're ready when you are. Uh, thanks, for, uh, Madam Program Director. And morning, morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Salom Hale from DSAA. I'm, I'm going to present continuous assessment. Thank you, program director. Can you scroll to the first slide? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just to give you a background regarding continuous assessment, Majority of the modules in School of Engineering follows a continuous assessment route. This entails the submission of the assessment of the assignment and writing of tests. There are no formal exam at the end of the year. Each lecturer compiles the assessment plan 
that serve as a criteria of assessing the student. Can you kindly scroll down, ma'am? The, the assessment plan of most of the modules are structured the same way as they have two assignments and three major tests. Most of the modules that are having GA or in brackets graduate attributes are having six, six assessments. You will actually recall when uh, Prof. Ndo actually explained about uh, GA assessment. So a module that is having a GA assessment, a student is compelled to pass any one of the two assessments with 50% Mark. Thank you, ma'am. You can scroll down. Should it happen? Should it happen that the A mark is, for example, seventy percent, but the student failed the G assessment? You automatically fail the module. G assessment are compulsory, and if you fail the first assessment of G A then you will have another opportunity to do the second one unless the lecturer decides otherwise. You can scroll down, ma'am. Furthermore, should it happen that you are sick or your, your personal circumstances do not allow you to write any of the tests, then you will be able to cover with subsequent tests. Unfortunately, it, if you miss the last test, then no special test will be given. At least you need to write two of the major tests. So just to briefly indicate, uh, to explain this one. So it happens that the student maybe was actually sick. If the student is sick, cannot actually write. So the, some of the students will actually come and say, no, can you please arrange? No, in that regard, it doesn't work. If you miss the first one, then you will cover the last two. If you fail the last one, the last, so which is assessment number three, then unfortunately, there won't be any special arrangement that will be done for the student. So I just wanted to put this one into context. Thank you. You can scroll down, ma'am. Major tests are written on my exams platform, and a special link for six set will be sent to the student by, by the lecturer. Other assessments are written on my, on my module. So in this regard, the lecturer will actually communicate to the student about the exact platform where the student is supposed to write. So even in the system, when the student goes on my module, we'll be able to see whether this one is a major test or not. So normally the major tests are linked to Aries. Thank you, ma'am. So you can scroll down. All, all major tests are Aries proctored and students are compelled to use Aries as an invigilation tool. So just to put to explain this one, if the student writes the exam and then the the particular major test error is not popping up. The student is not supposed to proceed, but supposed to report to the lecturer so that he can he or she can get assistance with regard to technical assistance. If you write the test without using errors, you will get zero for that particular assessment. You will recall where Dr. Ali was actually clarifying about errors. If you write without using errors, unfortunately, you will get zero from the onset. So for that particular assessment, you will get zero. Thank you, ma'am. The test is set for two hours and you have 30 minutes to upload your script. Students who are registered for EUP, please know that this module follows a continuous assessment route. So I actually wanted to put this one to explain this one for EUP because it falls under school, school of uh, computing. So the student must actually know very well from the onset to say that EUP, it follows the very same route as continuous assessment. So the structure is, is more or less the same. Thank you. You can scroll down, ma'am. Yeah, this, this, uh, this is a typical example of a assessment plan. If you can actually see the module that you actually use is EEP 3701. If you look on the on this, the number of assessment, there are basically five. So assessment number one and assessment number three, they are basically minor assessment. And then assessment number two, four, and five, respectively. These are the major tests. So the students got an option either to do three, three of them or two. Should it happen that the student was sick or maybe personal circumstances 
didn't allow the student to write, then the students got the option to write four and five. Should it happen that the student miss only the two, two major tests, then chances are slim that the student will pass the module. So it's very much, it's very much important for the student to make sure that at least he, he, or, he or she writes two major tests. You can scroll down, ma'am. Yeah, this this one, uh, this basically a screenshot of the the year mark as well as yeah the year mark as well as the sub minimum. You see the wait for the for the for the for the whole as assessment is hundred percent. So what's happening here? The student when he writes when he writes the exam, so he must actually make sure the not the yeah the the major test. The student must get a sub minimum of fifty. 50% and then the weight for the assessment is 100%. And then if you see on the right, on the, on the right where it says elective required, as I alluded initially to say that the students yeah, is writing three and then two of the best marks will actually be used uh, to, to contribute to their final mark. So you can scroll down, ma'am. Yeah. This one, this, this is a screenshot of the assessment plan that is actually having the, the graduate attributes. So you will actually recall where Prof. Ndu uh, was actually explaining about the graduate attributes. So if you look at the structure of this assessment plan, assessment number two as well as assessment number five, they're actually linked together. So in this regard, should it happen that the student fails assessment number two? So we'll have the opportunity to do number number five. So if the student fails assessment number five, number five, and then the, of, or, or maybe didn't write number two. So if he fails number five, the student if fails the module automatically, regardless of whether the year mark is 60 or 70. So this number two and number five, these are compulsory assessment. So the student must at least get 50%. Uh, in order to pass the module. So, and it doesn't guarantee, it doesn't automatically mean that if the student got 50% on this particular uh, graduate attribute assessment, then automatically passes. No, the other the other ways of the assessment are going to be taken into account. So the, the, other, the other marks of the other assessment rather will be taken into account as well. So if the student fails this assessment number, number two or number five, each of one, so the student needs to make sure that he, he gets a better mark. So if he fails one one major uh, major test for not the major test rather the number two or number five, which is aligned to graduate attribute, then he's going to fail automatically, regardless of what the year mark is. And then the other one is number three, number four, and number six. These are the major tests. There, there, there are three major tests, as I said, uh, the structure of the assessment plan makes provision for three major tests. So the student must at least make sure that he writes two. If he decides to write three major tests, so the best highest mark of the two assessments will be taken into account. You can scroll down, ma'am. Yeah, this this one, it also shows the sub-minimum the student is supposed to get, which is uh, 50%. So as I said, the student needs to make sure that regardless of what the student gets, as far as the graduate attributes are concerned, the student must get 50%, and then that 50% will also take the other marks of the other assessment numbers into account. So if you look at the, the structure of the, of the assessment plan having, having the graduate attributes, so if you look on the side where it says elective required, so what's going to happen in, in this regard is that we take two, two best marks of the major test and then one, be, one best mark from the, from the GA assessment, which was number two and number five. So those one will be taken into account. And then what's happening is that the system is configured in such a way that it will pick up the best mark based on the way how the student actually submitted. You can scroll down, ma'am. Yeah, so I'm actually at the end of the presentation. 
And then if there's any further information that you need to know regarding the continuous assessment, then these are my colleagues that you can actually con contact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mukhale, for the presentation. And uh, to all of our students, please do not panic. The session is being recorded. So for those uh, contact details and any other information that you might still want to re-listen to after the session, it will be made available to you. Um, I'm aware that we are now beyond our allocated time slots, but I promise we'll try to <coughs> move as swiftly as possible. We are left with just two presentations, which are really of essence that you might also need to listen to. Um, with that said, I would like to invite Mr. George Lewuda to take us through now the recognition of prior learning processes, uh, particularly as it pertains to the College of Science, Engineering and Technology. Mr. Lewuda, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, and uh, good morning, colleagues, and good morning to you two students. Uh, Chair, uh, I'm located here, and mm -hmm. please expect uh, glitches on my presentation. Um, is my screen visible? Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, please put your slides on presentation mode. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, colleagues, good morning. And of course, uh, good morning to you two good students. My name is George, uh, the RPL coordinator of the college. Right. Um, I've been given 10 minutes and I have uh, 10 slides, meaning that I will have to take one minute on each slide. Um, but let me perhaps start with the end in mind by sharing the contacts because I'm not only speaking to the students with relevant experience to the qualification, I'm also speaking to those without experience, those who are not working, because chances are by the time you complete the qualification, you will be working in the relevant environment to the qualification and module. So one way or the other, we are still going to engage in terms of obtaining your module credits uh, through work experience, right? So please, uh, Chair, is my, because I'm blank here, is my screen visible? And what do you have there? Yes, we are on your cover slide, cover page slide, the one that's written RPL 15 February 2024 with your details. Oh. Yes, now oh, it's the okay. next slide. We are seeing the. Uh, my apologies. I think it, it is of high importance that um, everybody does uh, note my my contact details and the um, the email address of course because uh, i believe that most of us might be working and even if you don't we'll probably meet in the future if indeed you are working in the relevant uh, discipline so this is my contact number my office line uh, extension 9119 and that of my colleague 9227 my email address there Lydia G. Unisa, .a .a, and the rpl website which might uh, because i'm going to just present the summary of what the website contains and all the RPL coordinators residing in other colleges, their contacts are there, right? So I will take that. You have taken down my email address, my contact number uh, before I moved on to the presentation. Uh, one, two, three, gone. Thank you. So what are we all about? Uh, we are all about students with relevant experience towards the qualification itself and the, um, the module. So if they are working in the relevant ICT uh, environment and there are subjects that correlates with what you have done in the past, your current work, your skills, your competencies and experience, this is the right office now to demonstrate how your skills, how your competencies and work experience relates to the qualification itself or relates to the principles of the module. Uh, we are talking about mature learners here 
with valuable experience, uh, extensive, uh, applicable, and relevant experience towards the module. Uh, if, if, if you not have any work experience, um, you may not be an ideal uh, RPL applicant because uh, we are only focusing on those with applicable and relevant experience towards the qualification, right? So uh, I'm not going to dwell much on the definitions, RPL principles and criterion. I'm going to be practical as I possibly can because RPL is all about practice. It's all about what you are doing, what you are capable of uh, knowing in relation to what we are teaching here. So there are three forms of RPL processes. You have RPL for module credit, you have RPL for access and RPL for career development. The, the first one, which is RPL for module credit, it, it deals with the experience, the learned experience from it can be at work, it can be at church, it can be at home because learning happens in all contexts of life. Learning does not only happen in the universities. We learn uh, by doing, we learn at home, we learn at churches. So that much of uh, uncertificated type of learning, that type of uh, informal learning, informal, is worthy of recognition to us, right? So not only formal curricula, uh, is relevant to us so long as you are capable of knowing something and you can be able to demonstrate it by doing it that type of uh, knowledge skills competencies is relevant to us so only 50 percent of the qualification can be rpl what does that mean it means that if the diploma or degree has 32 modules we can only rpl you for half of the uh, modules which might be 16 uh, modules why because we are institution of learning we also want to contribute towards your development towards your academic progression so our responsibility is to instill knowledge and paradigms and doctrines hence the other 50 percent you still have to register and pass traditionally right uh, and the other 50 percent can come through rpl so what does that mean it means that uh Students will say, George, I have looked at this qualification at this module and I felt that half of these modules is probably something that I have done in the past or I'm still currently busy with. Can I be exempted on such basis? So the answer is true. You can be exempted through RPL processes and this is how it's going to work, right? Obviously, you are a registered student. You have applied for admission. You have been admitted. You have registered now. The duty is to identify possible modules for RPL. The duty now is to identify modules that speaks to your own profile, that speaks to your own experience and, and learning. And once you have identified those spe uh, specific modules, it can be first level, it can be second level module. You need to work on uh, compiling portfolio of evidence to demonstrate that whatever the syllabus is, whatever the principles, the outcome of the module is, your work experience, your profile and skills actually equate to those principles. So th that, that, that is the, 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 the application procedure. Uh, apply for admission, get registered, identify possible modules for uh, RPL, compile comprehensive evidence, that will demonstrate that whatever that you have done in the past or you are, working, you are doing at workplace actually speaks to the syllabus or the requirement of the module. What would be the, the RPL evidence? Now you have called the RPL office to say, I have identified possible modules for RPL. What kind of evidence should I demonstrate to the department or to the RPL office that indeed my experience uh, addresses the learning outcomes? We, we, we will obviously send you the RPL application form. Then we need a comprehensive CV, a job description signed by your contactable line manager. We need projects or reports that you have successfully completed, right? And I want to stress the issue of a job description. Um, by virtue of just working or submitting a job description, that does not guarantee an approval because that is the relationship between you and your employer. From where we are sitting, from where George is sitting, we are not certain if indeed you are able to meet your targets, right? So it's only through the NTA performance review that your employer would know if you have been able to 
do the work as you have been mandated or supposed to be doing. So there are other documents that you still need to compile and demonstrate to us that over and above my job description, this is how now I'm doing the work, right? So a, a lot of uh, students will just submit uh, a job description and expect us to credit them for a specific modules. The answer is no, right? You need to compile comprehensive portfolio of evidence that speaks to the requirements. It can be the reports, it can be the projects that you have completed at work. We need to know the description of the project. We need to know your involvement in that project and uh, the conclusion, the outcome of that project, right? If you have any uh, certificates that you have acquired, uh, industry oriented certificates, and I'm talking about uh, trade tests for those who are residing in engineering, uh, diplomas, those in IT, I'm tweeting about your N+, your C+, your ITEL, project management, Microsoft, uh, TOCAF, security, I'm tweeting about those certificates. If you have relative relevant industry certificates uh, that speaks to the specific curriculum or module, do also submit those. Uh, and if you have syllabi that we have covered as a result of that certificate, do also submit such certificates, right? Of course, the portfolio of evidence, uh, certificates, diplomas, degrees acquired elsewhere. And the motivation, just show us, just demonstrate to us how your uh, experience relates to the learning outcomes of the module. So it, the, 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 the evidence is not limited to this documentation. Remember, you also have the academic requirements, academic departments, guidelines, which you should satisfy as well. But for the purpose of this uh, meeting, let us not go in those to such extremes. For now, let's focus on the mandatory or general RPL requirements, which are the ones that are listed here. So how does the whole uh, process work? When we do the assessment here, all we want to focus on is what you know and what you can do, right? What you claim to know and what you are capable of doing. That is the core of RPL. Approach the RPL office to say that you have experience of over 20 years, you qualify for 60 or 25 modules. The issue is what can you do in relation to what we are teaching? There are cases of students who have over 10 years experience, but when you, when you tap into the experience and profile, you only determine that this person has been doing a routine work for more than 10 years and probably qualifies for one module. So it's not about uh, the number of years of experience. It's about what you have learned in those years, the ability, what you are capable of doing. So the assessment is we, 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 we compare the syllabus what we have presented to us. If there is 90% or 70% correlation to what you have done, what you are doing, what's the principles or the syllabus of, of the module, chances are that module will be approved, right? But if maybe there's 40%, if there's 50%, the, the, the RPR office or the academic department might say, we have identified the learning gaps. Can you uh, undertake this assignment to bridge the gap between formal and non-formal learning. And once you submit the assignment, now we will have reached that gap of say 50% or 40%. But you would know when you study the, 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 the module that at least uh, I meet 70% of the, of the curriculum through my experience. Then you would know that I'm a potential RPL applicant for approval of this specific module. Now, which are the uh, common uh, RPL qualifications that we would mostly receive applications from? Uh, all the diplomas in engineering, uh, those with the trade certificates, uh, amount in the previous diplomas, that would be uh, 120 credits of the 360 diploma. But with the new new diploma, which has extra graduate attributes, it may not be the case, right? So trade test, all those industry certificates uh, are very relevant to some of the modules. Uh, those in IT, I've mentioned the N+, plus, uh, I, ITEL, C+, plus, database administrators, if you are there, software developers, uh, this would be the, 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 the case with you. And uh, in mining engineering, we are looking at uh, those with uh, competent A, blasting certificates, competent B and C. 
And some of the practical modules, not practical, but will modules that you may qualify for will be in chemical, will be a CWL3601, civil PEC3601, electrical engineering WDL3601, industrial IPR3601, information technology can be all the ICT modules, course modules, uh, mining engineering, of course, it will be the project MIN2617, right? And this would be some of the BSCs uh, within which we receive applications from. The BSC generals, if you have uh, lab assistants here, uh, you are a potential RPL applicant for chemistry one and two or three, depending on the extensive knowledge that you had in relation to the to the module. So these are the popular BSC qualifications within which we receive the, the applications. This will bring us to the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lohuta, for a very, very informative presentation on RPL and the workings and the in and outs. Of course, you did share your contact details for our students who may still want to get further information after the session to contact you. So thank you for that. Um, and then colleagues, last but certainly not least, I wish to invite Mr. Maswika to please take the floor, Masuika Mulebo, to take us through the assistance with CSET queries. Um, he's going to let us in a bit on that space in terms of how that functions. Over to you, uh, Mr. Mulebo. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair, and good afternoon, colleagues and uh, students. My name is Masuka Malepo. Uh, I'm from Dinari, from the section called uh, Tuition and Learning Support. So I'm the coordinator there. So my email address, for sure, if you can be able to see my screen, is populated there as well as the numbers. Please keep it safe in case you're struggling with something always give us a call, then we should be able to help you. Uh, yeah. So how I'm coming from, we're dealing with uh, students' inquiries in most cases. So how do we interact with the students? Uh, Above there, you will see our other number, which is 0116709228. Also keep it safely in case you are struggling with something. And the email there is cset at unisa.ac.za. So during exams, we use cset exams at unisa.ac.za. We also have our face uh, to face interactions, we are found, our offices are found at first floor at Pani Pijana building. And then we also have the Facebook account there, which is UNISA College of Science, Engineering and Technology. And our Twitter handle is at UNISA Science. So we also interact with students from various departmental email boxes, which I believe in your tutorial letters 101 you'll find those particular email boxes so if there is anything that is needs the intervention of the academic department then you can be able to communicate with them there and if in case they don't respond please uh, shout and then we'll see if we can be able to reach out to them so that they can be able to help you so what is our purpose uh, we strive to provide a point of contact for students. We provide support to schools and academic departments with students related inquiries. We strive to establish and maintain relations with other stakeholders such as regions, college, colleges and other service departments. We try to create a student centered section and we also report at various sections or committees about student support. And then we strive to improve uh, student satisfaction. So we also try to handle inquiries and provide support relating to all stages of the student life cycle, which is from admissions through to graduations. 
And we also act as a conduit between ad hoc exemption section and academic departments for exemptions related inquiries. And lastly, we try to delight you as students with quality service. So with regard to the exemptions, I've already answered a couple of uh, inquiries on the chat box. If you want to apply for exemptions, you need to apply online. Please note that the college is in the middle of the process. Those applications that you make, they go straight to DSAR, to the section called ad hoc exemptions. And then from there, they'll work on that paperwork and then refer it to the college, which will come through to our office before they can be distributed to various academic departments. So for School of Engineering and School of Science, acceptable modules for applications are 10 years and less, and while for School of Computing is five years and less. So anything older will not be accepted. So we also need to understand that when you apply, since we are in the middle of the process, if there is any delay, try to understand that there's, there are some interdependencies there. So you may think we do not want to help you, but only to find there is a delay somewhere. But that shouldn't discourage you to try to reach out to us so that we can investigate and then try to help you. So in the college, we're working on a turnaround time of seven days. And if in case your application has been declined and you wish to do an appeal, please do that bringing a detailed evidence. Because if you still going to use the same information, surely the results uh, will still come the same way as they were before. So we also try to provide efficient approval of applications and timeless feedback from academic departments to avoid multiple student administrations. So the other thing that you should note for people who applied now in January and also now in February, the SAR is currently not processing exemptions due to the peak periods. The focus is on registrations, the audits, so once the registration is over, then that's when we'll start seeing the movement of those applications for exemptions. So on integrated tutor model, please note that uh, we do not offer face-to-face -face tutorials currently in all the schools, but we do have e-tutoring for some of the modules in all those schools. So after registrations, our academic support coordinators will link students to the modules that do have uh, each with us because there is a certain number that uh, the modules need to meet in order for that module to have an each with us. So in case you write an examination and you fail, you need to solicit help from the academics. Don't just sit there and isolate yourself without having to engage your academics for the necessary support so that you can be able to pass the module. So some other schools do offer the visual lessons or the e-tutor visual lessons. So for those who are missing the classroom environment, make sure that you can be able to attend those particular visual lessons. And when you are on those platforms for e-tutors, please try to participate and engage with other students there because that's the only way that you can be able to learn because i've seen now on the chat box people sharing the telegram links uh, which is not a bad thing but when writing assignments please avoid that you want to tackle those assignments as a group because it will have some negative consequences so if you continue to start with us as a college, we also try to appoint our postgraduate students to serve as e tutors, especially now that they've changed the requirements up until PhD level. So there are also some opportunities that we can be able to offer you. Thank you. That was my slide in short.
Thank you very much, Mr. Mulepu, for the presentation. Again, very crucial for us to be aware of these issues, the contact details, um, as you have shared. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh, colleagues, students, because of time, let me allow two burning questions. I know that we have throughout the program been uh, pu putting our questions in the chat box, um, but let me just take two hands. Um, so when I call out your name, you say who you are and who you are directing the question to. Thereafter, we will close the session once we've received the responses. Um, on the list here, I see a hand from Shabalala, specifically. Uh, you can unmute your mic. Please unmute your mic and you can go ahead with the question that you want to ask to any of our presenters. Okay, um, let's take Peter Wilson from Transnet Right. Your hand is up. If you want to ask a question, please do so by unmuting your mic. All right, hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, this is Pisitli Shabalala speaking. Um, sure. Thank you for the session and uh, yeah. Um, my question basically relates to um, students that haven't registered yet. Um, what's 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 going to be their what's going to be the plan of action regarding like stuff that is like assignments that has already been started and uh, uh, stuff of that nature. Like, are, are, are classes going to begin or are the assignments going to start once everybody has registered yet, or are you guys gonna wait? for some students to register and then begin the process of learning and teaching and number two with regards to the exemptions the um, exemptions the, the the gentleman stated something about diplomas and um etc so for people like us that have our diplomas can we can we apply for exemptions with regards to some of the modules that are are being offered by the university those are the only two burning questions from my side thank you Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mulepo. Would you like to respond to those about the exemption as well as the registration uh, query? Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. Regarding the registration, those who have registered, surely uh, you might be having some details as to when will assignments start, but you may find that there is no assignment already populated there in the tutorial letter so soon registration will be closed and when everybody has registered and then they can communicate especially the academic departments to say as uh, assignment number one for this module they have there are times when they send it and this is because before it was sent earlier, then students opt to do that in a group and then it disadvantage the students because they write one and the same assignment. So you'll be given a short period to be able to work on that so that you work on that assignment as a student, not as a group. So that uh, because as a group that is cheating, so you need to avoid that at all costs. So don't panic about those assignments soon. Uh, you will be given that for you to be able to start your assessments. And then with regard to, uh, because I think the issue of exemptions was raised earlier uh, with regard to those modules uh, from the diplomas. I don't know who raised it. Maybe that person could be the one to be able to, uh, to cover it. Thank you very much for that response. Um, I see Spesitle is also thankful for the responses you've given to him. Um, let's take the last burning question. That's Peter Wilson from Transnet Frights. Please unmute your mic and share your question. Okay, um, let's move on to Prosperous Dibagwane. Prosperous? Okay. 
Um, I wanted to ask about the laptops that are required for the Iris Invigilation app. What's the most suitable laptop that um, we should buy for, for, for the Iris? And another question that I always want, I, I also want to ask is, does this Iris app um, only apply for like engineering students or, or is it just for like all the, the STEM students, science, technology, engineering? Uh, thank you, Prosperous. Uh, Dr. Ali, would you like to respond to that? Dr. Ali? Okay, Mr. Sila Mukhale, any chance you might want to respond to that question? Regarding the iris invigilation um, tool, um, I'm just to just to respond to that is that what I know, like the way um, Dr. Dr. Ali actually alluded, is that the MacBook and Lenovo they are actually a little bit problematic because what we actually realize is that the students who are actually using those uh, laptops they are actually struggling, so. So the other thing with the laptops, maybe just to explain <clears throat> better, is that the student, it can be the old laptop, but you'll find that the students got so many things in the laptop. So at the end of the day, it affects the performance of the laptop. The laptop is is is, is very slow. Like uh, like recently, uh, just to answer that uh, that answer <clears throat> that question again is that the CTA uh, students they are also they are also using Iris. So What's happening is that even if the laptop is old, but as long as it doesn't have so many hindrances or obstacles, like the way maybe, for example, the storage space is fine. So you'll find that the laptop is actually working, even Iris. So normally we, we even provide support to the student where they're struggling with Iris. Then we'll actually direct the student what to do. Then at the end of the day, you'll find that the laptop is old, but it's still working. So some of the laptops you'll find that uh, it's still new, but it's still having some challenges there and there. It still needs to be configured as such. So what I can actually advise the student in this regard is that it's best for the student to make sure that they clear the cache, they make sure that their laptop has got enough space because the more information the laptop is actually having, the, the more it's actually working slow. So you'll find that some students, when you try to support them, the laptop even takes more than 20 minutes to open. Some, it, it takes even more than one hour. So that is what I'm saying. At the end of the day, it depends upon the laptop. It can be, or it can be, it can still be new, but we only define that it's got so many information that is got in the inside it. So what what I would advise: make sure that it's got enough space because what uh, uh, that particular document that Dr. Ali uh, was actually displaying is got the specs as to what is actually required. So if the student go to the Iris practice, they will be able to get the, all the necessary information regarding. Iris as to what is equally required. But as, as I said initially, so if they struggle with Iris, for example, maybe they want to download it, we are actually there to assist. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for that response. Colleagues, we now have come to the end of our session. I realize that we have went over time. Um, I will then now release you to go and join other sessions. I know there's still student retention units, academic development, students with disabilities. There's quite a few sections still to go that you might want to hop into after this session. Thank you all so much for being an, an interactive and engaging audience. I thank also the presenters from the College of Science, Engineering and Technology for their well-prepared and informative presentations, which sparked a lot of interest and questions from our students. We as the College of Science, Engineering and Technology are looking forward to welcoming you or to seeing you into our facilities, into our campus, working with you. As you've seen, there's a variety of support systems that's available for you to take advantage of. Please uh, do enjoy the rest of the day. But before you go, um, in the chat box, I did post a link um, where I ask that you please kindly, it's just going to take a minute or so of your time to please let us know how the session went for you, any areas that you feel can be improved upon um, for the next sessions. Um,
with that, I wish to thank you all and uh, have a great day further. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Chair. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.